Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for having me here today. Um, so the paper I'm presenting today is, is joint work with um, uh, Kun Franken, who was also a speaker here, I believe, a couple of weeks ago, uh, who is now at Utrecht University, and uh, Bart Loss, uh, who is a co-author of mine uh, since the time I was uh, working at the uh, University of Groningen. So our affiliations give a nice representation of, uh, well, some uh, research centers in the Netherlands that are busy with innovation and, uh, and economic growth. So we have the north, uh, the, the, the middle, and, uh, and the south of, uh, of the Netherlands. Um, and uh, I think I would say that this, this paper is actually a contribution in the uh, emerging literature on uh, uh, evolutionary economic geography, uh, which is uh, uh, well, a field of research that where Kun Franken has been one of the pioneers together with, uh, with Ron Bosma. Um, and in this field of research, you uh, try to combine insights from evolutionary economics with insights from uh, economic geography and uh, model uh, regional development in uh, an evolutionary sense. Okay. So there have been theoretical contribution, but also a lot of empirical work uh, uh, in, uh, in, in this field in the last, uh, in the last decade, uh, I would say. Um, in this particular paper, we focus on uh, innovation and uh, the innovative performance of, of regions, in particular uh, the U.S. states in this case. Uh, and we look at, in this case, uh, technological invention. So we will use patent data to capture uh, innovation. Well, um, so to try and yeah, sketch a bit the motivation and also the objectives of, uh, of, uh, of this project uh, that uh, that I'm presenting. Um, well, one of the starting points when one tries to understand differential performance in terms of innovation of, of different regions, so, so why does the region, uh, well, why is the region uh, able to produce many more uh, innovations in another region? Uh, one of the, let's say, uh, stylized facts coming out of, uh, well, many empirical studies as well is that uh, regional innovation is very much based upon what is available in that region in terms of uh, uh, knowledge, resources, uh, capabilities, operations, and activity. Huh? So the, this very fact that uh, innovation is sourced locally huh, for different reasons having to do with the importance of proximity, uh, with the fact that uh, firms and other actors uh, uh, search uh, locally and boundedly for, for new ideas and opportunities, um, well, th this very fact basically uh, also leads to the idea that uh, the best way to characterize regional development when it comes to innovation production is of uh, uh, an evolutionary process with a very strong degree of path dependence. Huh? So you can imagine if the region already has uh, a pool of resources, knowledge, operations, activities going on, uh, they can they are able to do even more. Huh, to uh, they are. Uh, much better uh, capable to start <laughs> new uh, activities when it comes to innovation. Uh, and so their success breeds farther success in, in the future, while if the region uh, lacks those uh, knowledge pools, resources, and activities, uh, it will have a harder time uh, uh, when it comes to uh, innovative performance. Huh? So that would be the typical uh, yeah, evolution uh, pattern that you would, uh, would find. Uh, um, and when it comes to, to innovation, uh, the, the other uh, theoretical insight that comes more from, uh, from uh, innovation studies, but also on, uh, from yeah, theories of recombinant innovation, is that when it comes to innovation, uh, to, to innovating, um, yeah, the, the basic process going on is one of recombining pieces of knowledge. Huh? Um, so if this is the case, I mean, this is the Schumpeterian idea of uh, uh, that innovation uh, recombines uh, and puts together existing uh, pieces of knowledge, existing activities and operations and products, uh, um, then uh, it's quite easy then to deduct that, uh, um, that um, uh, regional performance when it comes to innovation will depend on the variety of activities that are available locally. In particular, the concept of related variety has played a key role in uh, this evolutionary economic geography uh, literature, 
with the idea that uh, if variety is related, huh, so if you have uh, uh, cognitive structures uh, underlying similar uh, uh, knowledge items that, that relate sectors, then it's much easier for firms and for actors involved in innovation, um, much easier for them to recognize these combinations and especially successful combinations. Huh? So Room. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so if, if search for innovation is, is bounded by the cognitive capabilities of, of actors, then you can imagine that uh, if uh, there are relations between the sectors that are already available in that region, then uh, that, uh, um, that uh, makes it easier to, yeah, to create new combinations as well. And in this literature on, uh, let's say, the positive effect of related variety on a region economic success, uh, mostly uh, this, um, uh, this hypothesis on the effect of innovation has been kind of an intermediary, uh, unobserved uh, process. Huh? So they, uh, even in work by, by Tim Franken and co-authors, they basically assumed, okay, we, we will test for a positive relation between related variety and economic growth of the region, assuming that uh, related variety increases innovation and innovation is good for economic growth. Huh? Uh, but in fact, they have never tested directly whether related variety uh, does indeed increase the success of innovation at the regional level. Huh? So the first empirical contribution uh, is indeed the one of checking these direct linkages. Uh, so we want to see whether uh, related variety uh, does indeed have a positive effect on uh, the innovation performance of, of, of regions. Um, and on the other hand, and, uh, what is more a theoretical objective uh, in this paper is also that we want to extend uh, this hypothesis on the effect of related variety by saying uh, until now yeah, uh, people have looked at innovative performance in general, uh, but in fact we know from you know, uh, decades of innovation studies that innovations differ quite a lot in their significance, <coughs> importance, and impact, and that, the, that we can broadly at least distinguish between uh, more radical uh, innovation, often called now breakthrough type of inventions, uh, and uh, the larger set of incremental innovations. Huh? And we also know that uh, this, yeah, the breakthrough innovations differ uh, significantly with respect to incremental innovation in terms of uh, generating processes, in terms of the level of uncertainty that surrounds <coughs> them. Huh? So um, while for incremental innovation, typically you have low levels of uncertainty uh, uh, um, in, the, in the terminology used by, by DOSI within the technological uh, trajectories, the trajectory is already there, so it's about uh, working within the trajectory, within the schemes uh, of thoughts of the trajectory, while breakthrough inventions would be the ones actually starting a new, a new paradigm uh, and a new trajectories. Huh? So, uh, well, we claim that in fact, uh, uh, for those types of innovation, we would expect not so much related variety, but more unrelated variety to uh, to play a role, huh? and that's what we we are also going uh, going uh, to test with our data. Uh, so the, the idea is that yeah, whenever uh, the breakthrough inventions somehow come out of more unlikely combinations of existing uh, uh, knowledge pieces, knowledge items, uh, uh, or resources. Uh, that, uh, uh, and those unlikely combinations are also the most likely typically to, to fail. Uh, so there is much, a much higher risk, uh, higher variability <coughs> of uh, the outcomes of those uh, of those projects, but the ones that, that do succeed, uh, they, they then are able to uh, to actually uh, yeah, create new technological fields, uh, uh, create new opportunities, and eventually, once a breakthrough invention uh, is out there, uh, it also creates new knowledge bases that makes uh, other knowledge items related. Uh, so, um, of course. Related and unrelated variety is is a is a dynamic concept. Right? So it's you observe it at the one point one point in time. You say, okay, these two knowledge bases <coughs> are unrelated or related. But once a new invention is out there, they might as well become correlated. Uh, 
so our hypothesis will be that um, unrelated variety uh, stimulates the ability of the region to uh, develop breakthrough inventions. Mm -hmm. And the challenge uh, empirically is also the one of trying to identify those breakthrough inventions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, there have been recently uh, quite some studies trying to do that. A lot of them using Kagan data, and those are the data that we also use in this paper. Uh, so we are only looking at technological inventions, patented technological <coughs> inventions. Mm -hmm. So of course uh, I'm, I'm using innovation and invention, but uh, I'm really talking about technological inventions here. Um, we do our analysis to the US, so we use uh, uh, US PTO patent data, and with, the, with patent data we can um, uh, both try to identify uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the inventive performance of regions and their ability to uh, generate breakthrough uh, inventions. Um, and we can also uh, derive measures of related and unrelated variety. Uh, so we can, we can see in which technological classes uh, regions, uh, firms in, in a given region uh, fake. So that's, we use patent data both for our uh, explanatory variables, for the related variety measures, but also for, uh, <coughs> for the output uh, measure. Um, and yeah, we use the NBR uh, database, which is, uh, has been uh, widely exploited by researchers within innovation. And we uh, take a subset for which we can observe enough citations uh, collected by patent. And citations, uh, uh, we use them as a measure of uh, the value of, of a patent. Um, we only focus on uh, US patents, and by that we mean a, a patent for which the first inventor uh, is based in, in the US, and we are able to assign patents to US states, and that will be our definition of, of region uh, for this study. And the other attractive feature of, uh, of this patent data is also that we can assign patents to a number of technological fields, uh, and this <coughs> classification scheme uh, <laughs> has different levels of aggregation. Uh, so we can distinguish between very broad technological fields and more detailed ones. Uh, and that allows us to exactly define uh, uh, yeah, more related and more unrelated variety in a way that I will explain in a moment. Okay, so this is about the data. So let me start with, uh, uh, with exactly the measures of variety. Um, so as I said, we basically look at the, the, all the patents that are, uh, have, have been uh, uh, granted to firms located in a, in a certain US state and in which categories uh, uh, they, are, um, they are applied to. And particularly, we can distinguish between six very broad categories, uh, 31 uh, in between or subcategories and uh, almost 300 uh, uh, more disaggregated technological classes. And uh, each patent is assigned to only one of these. Uh, this classification scheme was developed by Browning Hall and, uh, and co-authors uh, uh, together with the NBR database. Um, we use as a measure of variety entropy. Uh, entropy has been used uh, by other innovation researchers to measure variety of a distribution is basically a measure of uncertainty uh, of a distribution. Uh, so the more concentrated uh, and less, uh, the more concentrated and the less variety, um, the, the lower the, in the entropy. So at the, the extreme case, you have zero entropy when uh, uh, a region only patents in one classes, one class. So you have basically no uncertainty about where those patents are, they are in that specific class, and you have the highest uh, uh, level of uncertainty, so highest level of variety, where when uh, basically a, a region patents uh, uh, the same number of patents in all, in all classes. Huh? So you have the highest uncertainty about which, uh, which class would it be that a patent is, uh, is developing. And uh, um, a nice feature of uh, entropy as a measure of variety is that you can decompose uh, overall entropy um, in uh, components that refer to different levels of aggregation. 
So in our case, um, we can uh, define and raise the variety as being uh, the variety across uh, the broadest category. Huh? So those uh, large category uh, are the most uh, unrelated. Huh? Uh, while if we go uh, down to the uh, highest level of ag aggregation, uh, you have the, the, uh, the highest relation between two categories. Huh? Um, and since we have three, uh, uh, three levels uh, in the simplification, we also define a semi-related variety. Huh? So we, we, we basically try to use all the information we have in our data. Okay. And so in principle, since it is a decomposition, those uh, three components uh, should be orthogonal. Right? So the, you could have a region uh, with a very high and related variety, uh, a very low related variety. Right? So they are pasted across very broad different uh, categories, uh, but in within these categories, uh, they, they just specialize very much. Right? They concentrate uh, in a few of these pasted classes. But um, if you look empirically at uh, the relation between related and unrelated variety, you see, and, and this is the result that we find also in other studies, that they are typically yeah, rather, um, uh, yeah, rather significantly correlated positively. Right? So typically states which have a high related variety will tend to have a high unrelated variety. Right? So you can imagine, so if, if some certain regions are able to specialize in very different uh, classes, they, they do so also at different levels of aggregation. At the same time, uh, it is possible to observe uh, states which have uh, similar levels of unrelated varieties, but very different levels of, of related varieties. Uh, so these are some cases, right? So you have a rather low level of unrelated variety, while low means in, in Delaware, uh, but a higher, higher related variety which covers many more of these detailed patent classes. <coughs> okay, um, yeah, so this is the part where we try to identify a breakthrough invention, huh? what we call superstar patents. Uh, that's why uh, the superstars uh, here in the picture. So they, this is work that, uh, that me and Bartlos have been doing in, uh, in, the, in the last couple of years, uh, uh, where we, uh, we try to develop <coughs> indicators on uh, these breakthrough inventions using patent data. And what people uh, typically do, they, they simply uh, define uh, breakthrough inventions to be uh, the top 1% or the top 5% of most cited uh, of, of patents. Um, but that type of uh, uh, definition assumes that basically in all technological fields, in all years, that you always have the same uh, percentage of breakthroughs, which uh, yeah, doesn't sound uh, very realistic uh, because we know that technologies go through uh, life cycles uh, and so typically breakthroughs will concentrate at the beginning of a life cycle. And um, we also know that uh, yeah, if you compare across years, uh, uh, different technologies uh, might have a very different uh, uh, shares of breakthroughs. So what we try to do is to find an endogenous way to determine these breakthroughs, right? to uh, use the data themselves, use the statistical properties of the data to derive uh, uh, the actual share of breakthroughs from, uh, uh, from the information on the citations received by patents. Um, <coughs> so basically we draw from results that have been uh, derived from many other phenomena. I mean, uh, if you think about income distribution, uh, the work of Pareto already showed that, uh, yeah, that uh, uh, basically uh, the income distribution has a rather uh, heavy tail in the sense that uh, people earning uh, substantial uh, amounts of money uh, are a non-negligible uh, set of, uh, of all uh, observations distribution and in fact many other uh, um, phenomena like the distribution of uh, uh, city size uh, the 
the number of links of the web pages, uh, the, the frequency of words used in text, uh, they show uh, uh, this type of um, distribution with heavy tails, where typically people have found that distribution are, be are best captured by uh, a normal, low normal part of the distribution, uh, which refer to all observation except the outliers and a, a heavy tail which has a Parisian uh, uh, form. And for the case of patents, um, Silver and Verstagen in the Journal of Econometrics already found that indeed um, yeah, the highly cited patents have um, properties of Parisian distributions. So to give um, the intuition of how we can use this statistical property to derive our indicators of breakthrough uh, patents, Maybe this is a, a graphical representation of uh, the distribution and what you, uh, how you, you read this plot is basically if you, if you have a curve, a, a distribution that's a sign of a, a log normal, of normal uh, distribution, and if you have a linear, uh, um, a linear a pattern, then uh, that will be a sign of a Pareto uh, distribution. Uh, so if you, if you plot distributions of number of applications received by uh, patents, groups of patents uh, in a given technology, in a given year, you see that indeed uh, yeah, the, the tail, uh, so the number of patents receiving very high numbers of applications, are uh, well described by uh, uh, linear um, uh, pattern, so uh, Pareto distribution, and the rest by log normal. So the idea is uh, to try to estimate between these two different uh, uh, um, 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 parts of the distribution, uh, so derive from the data where the tail starts. Uh, so if you can find out where the linear part starts and the curved one uh, finishes, then uh, you can uh, deduct from the data uh, how many of the patents are can be classified as uh, breakthrough or superstar patents. And this might change across technologies or across years. Right? So in this case, we chose two different technologies. And for the case of, of biotech in 1975, it took uh, 17 citations to be considered uh, a very high uh, cited patent. For lithium, it took uh, 33 citations. Huh? So they are different. Um, yeah, these statistical process properties, in a way, also reflect what I was beginning, the fact that um, breakthrough inventions uh, come out of different generation processes, and so they have uh, uh, very different levels of uncertainty, a variety uh, uh, behind them. Okay. So what, in terms of, uh, of empirics, we basically um, uh, estimate two uh, regression models. Huh? So when you first uh, look at uh, uh, the general inventive performance of, of the lithium. So we look at the number of patents that, um, uh, that actors in, a, in, in the US states have been able to produce in a given year. Um, and uh, for the second model, we look at uh, <coughs> the share um, of superstars so that they've been able to produce. Huh? So it's the kind of measure of specialization in um, Break, um, in breakthrough productions. And um, in both cases, we look at uh, the effect of related varieties uh, in its different forms, unrelated, semi-related, and related variety indicators. And um, we control for the R&D level in the US state. Uh, basically, that's <coughs> the most important input for the inventive process. Uh, so given that we are considered the technical and technological type of uh, invention. Um, R&D data are yeah, basically all R&D is censored by, by Spain. Um, and um, we also take into account uh, state level and, um, and time, uh, state level preference and a time parameter. So I'll, I will uh, show you this in a, in a moment. Um, so we, we do this for yeah, uh, the years from 1979 for the 51 uh, US states. And yeah, for the first uh, regression model, uh, 
basically if you, uh, it's a count uh, that we are trying to explain so we use the negative binomial and for the other case uh, the share uh, we can use a linear model yeah so uh, this uh, <coughs> sorry this said but so this group that starts I'm confused it's like oh, yeah. it's all passing after the first one yes yeah so you count uh, how many patents uh, have received more citation than this cutoff yeah of breakthrough inventions. Huh? So uh, basically, yeah, but, you <coughs> yeah, but um, you, other, yeah, uh, otherwise you, you could have just said, okay, I'll, I'll take for every technology, I'll just uh, take the, the, five, the top 5% or any other quantile that you think that sounds reasonable. Um, but yeah, that would be fixed. Okay, so this is um, uh, these are the results for uh, the overall uh, inventive performance of regions. Huh? So the number of, of patents, uh, uh, all patents, uh, and uh, yeah, we, we estimated uh, some uh, three metric models. So the first model with only R and D, huh, which is already uh, R and D is, is strongly uh, correlated to uh, inventive performance. Uh, so it's very does a very good job. And we inserted also state down some time trend, which explain also quite a lot. Um, you have to think that R&D data differ quite a lot across your states. Uh, so there are states who do a lot of R&D and other states who do uh, marginally uh, R&D. Um, so once you, you take the state level effects into account, in fact, uh, the R&D variable uh, even becomes uh, not significant, and there is also a clear uh, trend in R and D uh, expenditure. Huh? So that also contributes uh, to explaining uh, this pattern. Um, and then eventually we also insert our uh, related and unrelated variety measures, and we find so for overall event performance of region that uh, the only variety that that plays a significant role is related variety. Huh? So that that is in line with uh, all the hypotheses from the uh, economic geography testing a positive effect of related variety on on uh, inventive performance uh, of regions. <coughs> <coughs> um, when we look at the share of superstars, uh, we do the same, uh, first R and D, then uh, we insert the state and time uh, metric variables, and then our, the related variety measures, uh, we find related variety is not significant anymore. So it doesn't seem to, uh, to benefit uh, the ability to generate breakthroughs, huh? while unrelated variety is positive. Huh? We do also find a, a bit of a weird result that semi-related variety is significantly negative, huh? uh, which is something that we cannot entirely explain. Huh? Um, and uh, this, I mean, uh, if we take same are related variable, uh, the, the, the effect of the other two remain quite qualitatively uh, the same. Huh? So it, it doesn't uh, undermine uh, the other two results. But you know, we think since we have all the data, why, why not use all the information to, to test it in? But we still have to find a bit of a, of a logical explanation for that. But we do find uh, you know, that what we expect uh, to be uh, a, a positive effect of an unrelated variety, while related variety does not uh, play a big role for uh, generating breakthroughs. Okay, okay so, um, so basically, so our empirical contribution, as I already announced at the beginning, was to provide a direct test of uh, the effects of uh, different types of variety on uh, inventive and we've added um, the story about unrelated variety having an effect on 
breakthrough invention, which, uh, which is, uh, was not there in, in the literature so far. Um, of course, you, you can think of many avenues for further research. Um, the easiest uh, one to think of is to do uh, other types of tests for other regions, not, not just US states, maybe the European region using European uh, uh, patient data or uh, maybe even extend to non-patent indicators of, of innovation. I mean, <coughs> here we haven't, uh, we haven't basically, we have only looked at inventions, we haven't looked at, uh, at commercialization at all. Um, you could also think about doing it at the uh, firm level instead of a regional level. 